I wish I would have known about Linux FX when I did the Linux MacBook build a few weeks ago. Just think, a Mac running Linux that drives like Windows. What a beautiful bastard child that would have been. Or ugly, depending on your perspective, I guess. Anyway, Linux FX is a distro that does its best to emulate Windows 10 as accurately as possible. But who is it really for? Let's take a look and find out. Okay, so if you want to get started with Linux FX for yourself, head over to SourceForge projects slash Linux FX devil slash files. I'm going to put a link to this in the description below, but over on the files tab here, click on download latest version. And it's a four gig file, so it's a pretty big download. It's going to take a minute for this to fully download. There is the torrent option, but we're just going to keep this tutorial simple here and go with this direct download. I also want to take a minute to point out that there is actually a version of Linux FX for Raspberry Pi out there available too. That's a little off topic here, but that is indeed a topic for another video, and I think I will be following up on this with the Raspberry Pi version at some point. But anyway, back to the topic at hand, we can see that our ISO is finished downloading here, so what we're going to do is we're going to use a program called Bellina Etcher to flash this ISO to a USB thumb drive. If you don't have Bellina Etcher already, head over to bellina.io slash etcher. I'm doing this on Windows, so I'm going to download the Windows 64-bit version. If you have Linux or Mac, make sure that you download the appropriate version for your system. Once Etcher is finished downloading, we're going to run that program. Now we get a window that looks like this. Here we're going to choose the ISO that we downloaded. We're going to choose our appropriate USB flash drive and hit flash. So now that it's done, you're going to see this screen right here. You can take that USB flash drive out, plug that into your target computer, and you're ready to boot up and install. So I had a 16 gig solid state hard drive in this machine, and that is generally above and beyond anything that you would need to do for a standard Linux installation. However, for this, uh, that was not going to be enough. I went and scrounged through my parts pile. I found a, an older hard drive I threw in this. It's not a solid state. It's going to be installed to a mechanical hard drive. Unfortunately, I would have really rather tested the performance on a solid state drive, but it is what it is, and you can't work with what you don't have. All right, back to square one. We do want this to be in English. We're just going to go straight to an installation. I do want American English, even though I barely speak it. I am in the New York time zone, so this is fine. I want an English US keyboard. I'm going to erase this disk and do a clean install. Just fill in the blanks here, and here we can choose to log in automatically without asking for a password. It is less secure if you do this. Since this is just a uh, test demo throwaway system, I'm going to go ahead and check that. But if you want your system to be more secure, leave that unchecked. Here I'm going to click on install, then install now. And it's going to go through and install this system to that hard drive. You'll notice that a lot of these demo screens are in Portuguese. That's because the software team behind this distro is out of Brazil. This part will take a few minutes, so just be patient. At the very end of my installation, I got this error. Basically, it says package live dash init ram fs is not installed, so it's not removed. Now, I am not a Linux guru, but to me, I read that as the package was not there, so it could not be removed. What I did was I just hit close here, and I rebooted the system, and the installation seemed to be okay. If I were going to run this full time, maybe I would look into troubleshooting that problem, but like I said, I rebooted this and had no problems. The system came right back up and ran normally. I didn't run into any problems. Okay, so we are booted into our installation now, and we are greeted with this Cortana-looking assistant, Haloa. The first thing we should do is check for driver and system updates. 
I will say that after multiple reboots and just kind of tooling around the system, it does feel a lot more sluggish than most Linux distros that I'm used to. I tend to mess around with the more uh, lightweight Linux distros, so this is generally not what I'm used to with a Linux distro. This thing is a lot more sluggish, and that may not be an issue on a more modern, more powerful set of hardware, but for this 12-year-old machine that I'm running this on, it is definitely not the best user experience. Now with that being said, this distro does come with a lot of extras installed out of the box, like it comes with things like uh, AnyDesk and Kodi and a bunch of other, um, I guess, what I would consider non-essential software packages. I personally am a bit of a minimalist. I like to have just what I need installed on an operating system. So this is really personally not my cup of tea when it comes to Linux. But with that rant over, they have done a phenomenal job of making this look like Windows 10. You have to dig pretty deep into the directory structure to really see that underneath it all, it is really Linux. And the iconography design is spot on. They've used Windows Office in place of LibreOffice for the icons. They've used the Windows System Preferences icon for preferences. They've used the Control Panel icon for administration. It really does feel like you're using Windows. If, where it could get confusing for someone is, say, if they always know something to live on a specific location on the C drive, and they go looking for that, and that doesn't exist, that could throw off a Windows user if they're not particularly computer savvy, but they just know where something lives through, say, familiarity or habit. But I think to the everyday user, the person who doesn't know what to look for that differentiates the different operating systems, most people are going to fall for this and think that it actually is Windows 10. And I think most users who are used to Windows are going to adapt to this and be able to use it right away with very little learning curve, at least for the basics anyway. You can easily add and remove software through the Ubuntu Software Center, and you've got the old standby of the Synaptic Package Manager as well. But in addition to that, you can also install EXE files, though your mileage may vary. As a test, I installed Microsoft Office 2007, expecting it to fail, but sure enough, through Wine emulation, it worked. And because this really is just Ubuntu with a paint job, you can always run any terminal command that works in Ubuntu on this system. So who do I think, in my humble opinion, that this distro is for? Is it a good OS for Windows users who want to migrate to Linux, but still want to keep the familiarity of Windows? Well, possibly. Is it good for someone who wants to completely replace Windows? Well, yes and no. It really depends on what kind of specialized software they use regularly. Keep in mind that under the skin, this is absolutely not Windows. And if there's a piece of software that is crucial to that user's day-to-day -day operations, and it just doesn't work on Linux, either natively or through emulation, then this user is going to be in for a very frustrating experience. Your average end user just wants things to work without putting a lot of troubleshooting or reverse engineering into making something work. A mechanic understands that the everyday driver just wants to get into the car and go. They don't care how a fuel injection system works, nor do they ever care to know. They just want it to work. And it's the same with an OS. If something doesn't do what they want it to do, they're going to go back to what is familiar and what they know. Is this good for someone who wants to try to learn Linux? In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, I would say no. I think the familiarity of Windows, the training wheels per se, is more of a hindrance when learning the nuances of Linux. Someone who says, I want to learn Linux, but I want it to behave like Windows, well, they're really not helping themselves to learn anything new, as I believe nothing new has ever been learned in a comfort zone. I think a better beginner distro for dipping your toe into the pool of Linux is Manjaro, and that's a distro that you guys turned me on to. Now, I believe this distro is not without its uses. Immediately, I think of elderly relatives who use Windows 10, but are very click-happy and prone to fall for scams, but are also against change and won't try anything new. This is a great way to drop a familiar working environment onto their PCs and call it a day. 
They get an OS that they're familiar with to use Office, Email, and Boomerbook, and you get the peace of mind of knowing that they won't be calling you to clean malware off of their machines every two weeks. You know who you are. I don't have to name names. Aunt Peg. The rambunctious side of me also thinks that this would be a fantastic toy for messing with tech support scammers. So that's my assessment of Linux FX. Leave a comment below to let us know if you have any ideas for any other creative uses for this distro. I'd like to give a huge thank you right now to my Patreon supporters, and if you would like to help the channel out, there will be a link to my Patreon page in the description below. Donations are appreciated, but never expected, especially as hard as things are for a lot of people right now. Look out for you and yours first. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of my other videos, and if you want to help my channel grow, do the YouTube stuff down there. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Your time is valuable, and I thank you so much for spending it watching this video. That's it for now, and I'll see you next time.